What is going on, everybody? John Middlecoff, 3 and Out Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever you may listen, Apple, Spotify. Download that AMP, Amazon AMP. We're live every single day. All the volumes, content, rocking and rolling, as well as YouTube. If you're watching this live, delayed, however you watch it, subscribe, leave a comment. Love it when you leave comments. Share it with your friends. And... um Got a big show coming up because a guy named Aaron Rodgers is now officially on the Jets. I'm officially going to the Sacramento Kings Golden State Warriors game. I couldn't be more excited. And uh, it's I, I haven't been to uh, a, a game in a while, any sport really. Uh, but I, I, I'm jacked and I'm going because of the official ticketing app of this podcast, three and out game time. Here's what you need to do if you want to go to a game. Download the game time app. And when you do, when you sign up and buy your first pair of tickets, comedy, concerts, games, you name it, use the promo code John. That's J-O-H-N. Get a uh, $20 discount on a pair of tickets. No big deal. Can't wait. I, I'm a little bummed that De'Aaron Fox is hurt, but I'll be there. You know, I, the dynasty ain't ready to die yet, baby. And uh, Lakers are coming because the Warriors are now going to win this series. But love myself a good 9-1-6 Sacramento Kings home big game there hasn't been one in like two decades but i'll be there game five baby because of my friends at game time buckle up start with rogers because you know biggest story of the day he's officially traded and uh the, the long and i listen i was exhausted with talking about the hypotheticals just happen and then we can give our thoughts and our takes on the trade but it was like, what's he going to go for? What are you going to do? Like, we'd all played that game too many times. <laughs> we, we've been playing it for months now. Uh, now we have clarity. And let's start with just the most basic part of the compensation. It was never going to be cheap. I don't care if he retires next year or plays three more seasons. To acquire Aaron Rodgers, it was going to cost some draft capital. That, that's just a reality. You want to join a nice country club? You want to drive a nice car? You want to live in a nice neighborhood? It ain't cheap. Acquiring quarterbacks, Hall of Fame quarterbacks, who just are a year removed from multiple MVPs, especially when you are desperate for a quarterback because you have never really had one. I'm 38 years old. Don't remember the Jets really going, God, sweet quarterback the Jets have. Doesn't happen. So you factor in desperation. You factor in he's Aaron freaking Rodgers. I get he's 39 years old. I get he threatens to retire all the time, but you were never getting them for like a second. And that like, that was, that was not happening. And now we know they swap first round picks, which is just two spots, 13 and 15. The jets get their, or excuse. Yeah. The Packers get their second round pick, which is pick 42. And they get their second round pick next year. And if Roger stays healthy, that pick goes to a one. And let's face it. Would it be worth pick 42 and pick 28 if you get to the second round of the playoffs and win 13 games and host a playoff game and play the Chiefs in another? Of course it would. You haven't made the playoffs in literally forever. Now that the Kings snap that streak, you have the longest streak going. Not in football, in pro sports in this country. So while you are in a major market, you, you've kind of faced irrelevancy. Now, is this a short-term buy? Of course it is. Is Aaron Rodgers probably going to retire at the end of the season? I would doubt it, but who knows? We'll get into all the variables and all the potential outcomes here. But I, I just seen a lot of reaction. I think it's fair that, like, God, you might have to give up pick 42 this year and a first-round pick. Because if he stays healthy, win or lose, it's kind of going to be the Carson Wentz. Remember when the Colts did not make the playoffs and they still had to give up a first-round pick? It's like, yeah, it's the cost of doing business. Like, that's, that's the reality. And, and listen. We all hate it in whatever thing we're dealing with. Things are more expensive in 2023 than they've literally ever been. And I'm not saying that should parallel what's going on with quarterback trade compensation, but the reality is he's Aaron freaking Rodgers. And you can't list, I don't know, seven quarterbacks in the history of the league that are better than him. Now, I get he's old, and I get last year was weird, and you could argue he's gotten a little weird, but you want Aaron Rodgers on your team, it's going to be expensive i.e. this trade. The Jets get to keep their first-round pick. They still have a second-round pick because they were willing to trade Elijah Moore. And they will be glad to give next year's first-round pick 
if it's like after 25 next year. Because that not only means they were in the playoffs, means they probably won a playoff game. And I, I would say that would be a successful season. Now, when you look at this situation, given what they paid, given Aaron Rodgers now has bitched and moaned for a couple of years about the Packers situation, there is a ton of pressure. We'll get to the Packers in a second. But you just look at the New York Jets in a vacuum because this is a short-term move. And whenever you do a short-term move, right, if I say, hey, you've saved up $100,000 to buy a home, put it on a stock, right, Zillow, Netflix, whatever, and you're like, well, I'm planning on buying a home in the next six months. If that stock goes the wrong way, disastrous short-term move. That thing doubles, fucking incredible, right? So if next year the, the New York Jets win 12 games, either win the division or are the top wild card team. It's a success. It completely worked. But let's not get it twisted. Now, Aaron Rodgers, you could argue, he's been one of the top, not just quarterbacks in the league, one of the top athletes in America now for a long period of time. He's used to having pressure on him. He plays for one of the biggest brands. He replaced Brett Favre. He understands pressure. But anytime you go to a new franchise, right, you don't have any equity with the Jets. You don't have any equity in the New York market, which is completely different than the Green Bay market. So there is an extraordinary amount of pressure on the situation. And when you factor in the GM, Joe Douglas, who whiffed on his draft pick, Zach Wilson. I mean, a complete whiff. The guy cannot play. He literally cannot play. And they've acknowledged that. And if you watched him, he couldn't hit basic routes. I, I mean, stuff that you have to do in high school football he was struggling to hit wheel routes, slant routes. The team turned on him. The front office turned on him. He was done. So it that's that happens in sports, right? Sometimes you miss on a pick, but you miss on the number two overall pick. No matter how many other picks you miss on, that's a problem. Well, now you trade for Aaron Rodgers. It almost doubles down. If this works out, it's all good. It's all gravy. You'll get an extension. If you get Aaron Rodgers for two years and make the playoffs both times, Woody Johnson is Cutting you guys, extending Robert Sala, Joe Douglas, Nate Hackett, singing Kumbaya. If you miss the playoffs, like Aaron Rodgers' legacy is already somewhat established, right? We'll get into him in a second, but like if this fails, it's not going to ruin him. It's just not. Now, if it succeeds, it will add something to him. But when you look at these guys, they're all in. All their chips are now in the middle of the table. Joe Douglas, Robert Sala, you know, the people surround that work for them, they are either getting extended or they're all going to get fired. It's really hard to see a middle ground. And this is the situation you set yourself up for when you have a disastrous pick at quarterback and your team's clearly not good enough. And the difference is like the 49ers might have had a disastrous pick at quarterback with Trey Lance, given that he just he becomes a backup. Hell, who knows? He might not even beat out Sam Darnold. But their team was good enough. They found another quarterback and their head coach calls the plays. That's the thing. So he comes in here. You know, the last several coaches, I mean, really Aaron Rodgers' entire career, McCarthy, LaFleur, offensive guys. Now, McCarthy gave up play calling, took it back or whatever, but that's his That's his thing. And obviously LaFleur has been the play caller the whole time. Now Rodgers, now I'm not saying he's clearly had a lot of influence with the Green Bay Packers, but he's in full control. Like this is kind of his show. And Robert Sala, a defensive guy who doesn't even call the defense, is kind of in this weird position. And it's not like he's ever had a ton of success as a head coach, given that he's only been on the job for two years. Now, he's had success as an assistant coach, but this is a different animal. And the pressure on this squad is just immense. Now, you could argue the other teams in that division, right? The Bills desperately need to get over the hump. I mean, they all, uh, potentially had the most embarrassing end to a season for a good team last year when the Bengals just... Molly whopped them. I mean, that was a curb stomping. The Miami Dolphins, ton of pressure because their team's really good, but the quarterback situation and the Patriots, like, fair or not, like, is Belichick coaching for his job? So the division is kind of fucking nuts. Now, with Rodgers, the roster, in theory, they should be right there with the Bills. They, they should be. But, you know, it's sometimes the NFL isn't just a plug-and-play league, and sometimes it is. I mean, once upon a time, Favre, once he went to the Minnesota Vikings, boom, had a great season. They were in the NFC Championship game. That happens this year with the Jets. It's all gravy. And when you think about Rodgers, like, listen, Rodgers is a first bout Hall of Famer. He's one of the best players of his era, any position, and obviously quarterback. But I do think, and if this is a disaster, whatever, 
a lot of people will blame the Jets. We saw what he did with the Packers. Goes to the Jets. will be like Robert Sala, Joe Douglas. It'll be other people's fault. Because that's usually the way it works with Rodgers to begin with. But let's say they have, let's say this works. Like, what if I tell you that in the next two years, Aaron Rodgers gets the New York Jets to a Super Bowl? Let's say he were to win one. Like, when you really look at his comp, it's kind of Peyton Manning. Now, I would put Peyton Manning above Rodgers. He's got five MVPs. Rodgers got four. Obviously, they both have, well, I guess Peyton has two Super Bowls. But he went to a couple other ones and lost. Remember, he lost to Drew Brees and he lost to Russell Wilson. It's part of one thing that's missing with Aaron Rodgers is a ton of success, a lot of conference championship games, but he's only been in the one Super Bowl. So if he could just get to another one, and definitely if he becomes a two-time Super Bowl champ, I think that would put him like 1A, 1B with Peyton and whatever, wherever you rank Peyton, fourth, fifth, whatever. I would put Rodgers right smack dab behind him. Now, you could argue he's still behind him, but you, right now when you look at the two resumes, there's a little bit of a gap. And one thing Peyton did, right, went to another team, boom, took the Broncos like a fucking rocket ship. They started kicking everyone's butt. Went to two Super Bowls, won one, winning MVPs there, was just dominating. They, they became a powerhouse. Rodgers is that with the Jets? Even if he weren't to win a Super Bowl, that'd be pretty impressive. I mean, this team has been a joke. I mean, let's face it. The way we talk about the Lions and the Browns and the Tex, some of these other teams, the Jets, let's Google their resume the last decade. It kind of looks a lot like that. So Rodgers, who, if this is a disaster, we'll make fun of him and everything. But big picture, I don't think it changes much. But I do think it can add to somewhat of the legend. And, and, and you can, you know, let's say he can't even catch Peyton Manning, so he doesn't necessarily need to win the other Super Bowl. But if you're just good, think about Joe Montana. It was like Joe Montana went to the Kansas City Chiefs, boom, had success back-to-back -back years. Pretty sure he went to a conference championship game. Rodgers can do that, be a big feather in his cap. It, it, it really will. Because he will get a ton of credit. Rodgers will. I don't think he'll he'll get short-term criticism, but ultimately, like, he's super rich, he's super accomplished. It'll be Douglas and Sala to get blown out, and Rodgers will just retire and go with Aubrey Marcus to, you know, snort ayahuasca and do whatever they do. But if he's successful, I think we'll talk about more, like, look what Aaron Rodgers did to the Jets more than, God, Joe Douglas. Of course Joe Douglas traded for Aaron Rodgers. And it'll be like, what did Robert Sala really do? Like, he's he's not even the coordinator, let alone calling the offense. So, Rodgers has a lot to gain. I don't know how much he has to lose. But at least this is over. We don't need to wait till draft night. We can kind of let it marinate. And, uh, you know, the Jets still get 15th overall pick. And they still get a second round pick. So, they should be able to get a couple starters to go along with the roster that I think we all view as pretty damn good. Let's look at the Packers now. I saw Richard Sherman said, and I don't necessarily disagree at all, that you're no longer feared. I guarantee you every NFC North team is excited to see Jordan Love. A a ecstatic. I guarantee it, Green Bay Packers. You Nobody will fear you going forward. Understand that. And I talked to a buddy in the NFL like, yeah, I don't take the Packers seriously anymore. For 30 years, they've had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. And every single year, like, you might have been a hater or whatever, they were getting picked to make the playoffs. And the overwhelming majority of those seasons, they made the playoffs. And a big reason why was Favre and freaking Rodgers. I'm sorry, those days are over. And, like, I don't think most people are going to pick them to make the playoffs. Now, obviously, just because people don't pick you or think you're going to be any good does not mean that you can't be good, right? We all thought the Giants were going to stink. Then they were solid. We all thought Seattle was going to draft number one overall. They went nine and eight, and they were in a playoff game. So I wouldn't bet my life that the Packers are going to stink or not be a playoff team. But history would show us you usually don't go Favre, Rodgers, and then another top 10 quarterback. It's probably over. Now, if LaFleur just turns out to be some stud coach, and I think he's pretty solid, but it's kind of hard to judge when you've had Aaron Rodgers playing at a really high level and Devontae Adams. And Gudekins right now, like, McCarthy and Ted Thompson became legends because when they traded Favre, and Favre had been kind of being a diva for years, they literally went to Aaron Rodgers. And then within a couple years, they won the Super Bowl. So it worked out perfect for them. And if I would say if Jordan Love is just like Dak Prescott or Kirk Cousins, these guys are getting large extensions, and they will be viewed as 
I, I don't want to say geniuses, but it'll be very, very impressive. The chances Jordan Love is those guys, though, to me is just slim to none. That's just not the way historically the NFL works. And when you just look at the math, like the, the likelihood that he's going to be a bottom 10 quarterback is complete. Like if you were a betting man, you would bet on that over to be the ninth best quarterback in the league, especially he's surrounded by a lot of young players. And it's not like this Packer team was dominant last year. And whether Rodgers obviously didn't have an MVP like season, he's still more than likely in 2022 better than Jordan Love is going to be in 2023. So if they went eight and nine last year, what are the chances they win seven games this year? I would say I would probably hammer the under. And I, I just think that more often than not, when you make these moves, it's not all their fault. Like Roger started acting weird. Devontae said, I'm not going to resign with you. But ultimately on Brian Gudekin's resume, he was the guy that traded Devontae Adams and traded Aaron Rodgers. Now, again, you put it in context, but we all know that's not exactly how it works. Right? There was a lot of variables with Favre. But Ted Thompson got the credit, pulled the trigger, transitioned, and they kept kicking ass. And his dude started winning MVPs and taking them into the playoffs and winning in the playoffs and hosting playoff games. I, I just think the likelihood of that is just not great. <laughs> you know. Now, the one thing they got going for them is the NFC isn't great, and their division is more than questionable. The, it's clear the Vikings are going through this transitional period. And the Lions are ultimately the Lions. Now, I love their roster. They got a lot going for them. But even they kind of had this bridge quarterback in Jared Goff, right? He's not, he's solid, but I wouldn't say he's their franchise quarterback. They could easily draft a young quarterback, you know, in the next week. And, you know, that transition to that guy, and that guy might not turn out to be good. But I, I think the day and age of just chalking out, you know, the Packers, like being the Pittsburgh Steelers every single year, winning 10 to 12 games, it's over. It ended. Very risky, uh, you know, and, and I just think that, you know, Gudikins and LaFleur, their careers, fair or not, are going to be defined by, I would say, the next 24 months. Because I would assume uh, they're going to pick up the fifth-year option. If Jordan Love is a quarterback that you give a contract extension to, all gravy. You, you're in great shape. But if in two years you're looking for another quarterback, they are in major trouble. Because we just know how hard it is to find, Right. It's it just, it's very, very difficult. The other thing, the best two players on this roster by a country mile over their run were Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers. Two players that this general manager and this head coach inherited. Now, I'm not trying to just shit on Brian Gudikins here. Whenever I've heard him talk and the way he's handled the situation has been impressive. They don't teach you how to deal with all this stuff when you're a road scout or the pro personnel director. This is only something you can learn kind of on the job. And you even have, you either have like the wherewithal, uh, you, you can take the the bullets that are going to come flying or you can't. And he's proven to be pretty impressive, at least to handle it publicly. But ultimately you get judged in this league, not on how you give a press conference or how many people in the media talk, you know, talk you up, it's about your wins and losses. And if you start losing some games and you start missing the playoffs a couple years in a row, the difference always was, when And listen, I, I've been watching the Packers. I mean, one, they've been one of the biggest national teams since Fox got the NFL. But when I was a kid, like in the Bay Area, in Northern California, they, they were the 49ers rival. And they were a powerhouse. And up through, you know, when I got in the league and they transitioned to Aaron Rodgers, like they might have missed some playoffs some of those years with Favre and Rodgers. But you always had one of those two guys the following year. And you went, this will turn it around. And more often than not, they did. They won double-digit games, they get back. They'd win the division. And they benefited their division, you know, I would say over that period of time has not been great, but they've had, you know, kind of the, you know, the most important thing you can have superstar quarterbacks, not, not really good quarterbacks. Not like, you know, you can win 10 games, 10, 12 games every year with cousins or Dak or, or Lamar or Kyler or whoever they had all time greats. I mean, both guys, I think without hesitation, I'm putting in my top 10. Definitely. I, listen, I'm not Belichick, a historian, but when you factor in my lifetime, easy top 10. I mean, you could, in my life, definitely the internet age, I mean, beside Brady and, and Manning, Roger would probably be third, right? Just of the best quarterback we've seen. Mahomes is obviously coming strong, uh, but what a day, you know? End of an era, 
And it's just, th this is why, you know, we'll talk a lot about the draft and character and the way guys are wired. The one thing that you can never truly know, because we, we've talked a lot about this with NIL. I just saw Caleb Williams got another big uh, NIL contract. Like he's just making millions of dollars. So when you draft Caleb Williams next year at number one overall, you you won't ask the question, well, like, how will he handle money? He's already a multimillionaire. He's already been a one percenter in a state where they tax the shit out of you. He's unfazed, right? He's living well. But what about when I start paying you hundreds of millions of dollars and you become easily one of the most famous people on the planet? Like, how do you handle it? How do you handle as you age younger players? Are you good with younger players? Or do you kind of act weird, right? One thing Tom Brady always hung his hat on is like, just a great teammate till his, till his, you know, retirement. Great with teammates. Guys loved him. Peyton Manning, I, I think, was probably equally kind of like hard on guys in practice. Some might say even more. Guys loved him. Guys loved him. And I think Rodgers, like, has kind of battled that as he's aged. He got so rich. He got so famous. You know, just not everyone handles that as smooth because it's hard. Like, I, I don't know how to handle that. Like, it, how can you be super famous and just Steph Curry, elite teammate? Like, it doesn't get any better. Like, it, it took Kobe Bryant till he got really old in the league to figure out how to be, like, good with other players. And, and Rodgers, like, kind of battled that. And, you know, that's the thing you, ju you just never know till you get. Obviously, Favre, you know, was kind of hit or miss with that as, as he got older because – their ego gets out of control. And the hard part is in a team sport, listen, every human worth their salt believes in themselves. I don't want to say it has some like narcissistic qualities, but like however you combine the ego and belief in yourself, whether that is some shades of narcissism or whatever, you know what I mean? But like when you play a team sport, when you're the leader of a company, like you, that, you got to be very cognizant of that as the lead guy, as the highest paid guy. And it's difficult. And I, I think Roger is going to be put to the test here. And it's, it's never easy from Jordan Love's shoes to follow the guy. And that's why Rogers was so impressive when he was young. Like it was to follow those shoes in, in Brett Favre. It's very, very difficult. I mean, look at Mac Jones last year. Started acting like an idiot. Like, yeah, I get it. Joe Judge and Matt Patricia don't know anything about offense. They, they should not be calling offense. But you look like a clown jumping up and down on the sideline. You're not Tom Brady or Peyton Manning, bro. You can't act like that, right? So it's very difficult to do what these guys are doing. The pressure, the money. The reason we talk about NFL television ratings is because everyone in the country, relative to other shows, is, is watching the product. There are more eyeballs on you in the NFL in a random week game, let alone big Sunday night games and Monday night games and then the playoffs. So it, the pre, it is the pre, this is the ultimate pressure cooker. And at quarterback, there's nothing like it, right? You're the most famous guy on the team. Literally everyone in the huddle looks at you. The coaches all, are all over your ass. It's just going to be fascinating to watch this all play out. I, I would bet on the Jets being pretty solid. I, I wouldn't bet my life savings on them winning like 11 or 12 games. But I think when you factor in their talent, assuming Rodgers still plays at a high level, they'll still be good. And if I was betting on the Packers, like six wins. <laughs> like I... That's just, I would bet on them not being that good. Just that simple. Because I think Rodgers is that freaking good. And he's that important. And let's face it, it's not like they're some defensive, don it's not like, well, you know, they've had like the 2012 Seattle's defense the last five or six years. They're not really built like that. They have been an offensive-oriented team, right? If I just take Patrick Mahomes away from Andy Reid and give him Jordan Love, like, I'd be like, well, it's Andy Reid. Maybe he can figure out a way to win nine games. But this is an eight-win team with Rodgers. So, Godspeed. Good luck. And the one thing I will say, the one thing I will say, Packer fans, you've had it well. You've had it really good. And you know this. I mean, I, I see you guys. I love the Packer fans. They are such an educated fan base. They love football. To me, like Packer fans, Steeler fans, are just such a knowledge when you talk to these guys just how much, because they've just watched so much good football. They know what it looks like. They even know the slight margins. And they'll even, like, I think they're ready for this, but they probably can't acknowledge yet that this could be a disaster. This could be really, really ugly. If you're a betting man, I, I think you, that's usually the side you have to pick when you make these transitions.
A couple other things. Uh, I, I was listening to uh, New Heights podcast with Jason and Travis, the Kelsey brothers. They had on Brock Purdy. And just listening, and I was listening to Rosillo's podcast, podcast with Jason Kelsey. He's just such an impressive guy. When we drafted him, I think it was my second year in Philly, he was kind of crazy. Not in like a bad way, but I just remember like partied pretty hard. Obviously won the job from the jump. And he was just, he was in a good way. And I, I, I mean, this positive, kind of wild man. And in a good, you want your linemen to be wild men. And obviously Travis Kelsey, who told Brock Purdy on the podcast, like I was a major red flag guy coming out of college. And obviously Jason fell in the draft because he was undersized. Travis fell in the draft because he had some red flags in college. And yet both those guys are first ballot Hall of Famers. And coming up here in the next couple of days, like we'll end up talking a lot about the first round picks and rightfully so. Those are the guys that you give a lot of money to. Those are the guys that, you know, tend historically to be major hits w- when you pick on them. But any of you guys that are fans of different teams want to know about the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round picks, right? And I've taken the stance of like, beside the top, like 50 guys in the draft, I don't pretend to act like this guy, some can't miss guy in the fourth or what a pick in the six. Cause it's impossible to know. No one has any clue. And as someone that has now been worked in the league and just gone to training camps for a decade, every single year you see this guy like, God, look at this random fifth round pick. Or look at this undrafted free agent whooping the second round picks ass. And listen to those two guys now and just following their careers and obviously going to the Niners practices who some of their best players, Fred Warner's a third round pick. George Kittle's a fifth round pick. Like they, they get guys that, you know, obviously Nick Bosa is a really high pick, but they have some of their core guys that were later round picks. And the reason is character. And I don't just mean the way you treat people. I just mean your character when it comes to football. So like, are you super focused? Do, does football mean everything to you? No matter what, are you, do you refuse to fail? Will you do absolutely everything in your power to be a good football player? Because clearly, once you make the league, for the most part, you have the requisite arm length, foot speed, you know, give or take an inch or a couple pounds or whatever. But like the margins for separating in this upcoming draft, a third round pick and a sixth round pick is very, very tiny. It's honestly, it's it's extremely small. And every single training camp immediately, that sixth or seventh round pick will be better than that third or second round pick. It'll happen all over the league. And you look around the league, there'll be sixth, seventh, fifth rounders starting. They'll win starting jobs. They will get veterans cut. And I don't care how deep we get into this, how much psychological testing we have. It's the coolest part about the draft, the stuff you can't quantify. Like all of a sudden you look back, like Travis Kelsey was a red flag guy. And then he became someone, every guy in the Kansas City Chiefs building, players, executives, coaches, Beloved. They, they, I mean, they they swear by the guy. They, they can't get enough of him. And this guy was a red flag guy coming out of college, right? So it just shows you how difficult it is. Some of these red flag players coming out of college. I remember talking to the Chiefs when they had the Honey Badger. They're like, favorite player on my team. <laughs> Love the guy. He was kicked out of LSU. Didn't go till the third round. He's been a team captain on three different teams in the NFL. But if everyone knew that, that maturity and focus and whatever the question marks were, he would have been a top 20 pick. But you can't know that at the time when you take, because they're kids. They're 21, 22 years old. And I I say this all the time. Like, I speak for myself because I do think I represent a lot of guys. Like, we, most of us are not locked and loaded at 20 years old, are ready to start a company, are ready to be some starting quarterback, are mature enough to handle it. Whether you're, any industry, including football. But as you grow, as you get older, as you surround yourself with either higher level people, dis successful people, we mature. And like there, it's impossible to know. It's absolutely, you can't figure it out. And I I think one thing I watched John Lynch's press conference today talking about the draft, they're non-negotiable when it comes to drafting in in the recent years is football character and physicality. And I think if you have high football character and you're physical, because I think sometimes like on tape, 
if you have really good numbers or maybe you produced, it's like, well, you know, we've heard he doesn't love football and sometimes he'll turn down contact, but God, you know, he had 12 touchdowns. Those are the guys, once you get to the league, because it's way harder, preparation, the demand of everything, usually don't work. Like when you look at Jason Kelsey and Travis Kelsey, those guys are football junkies. It means everything to them. George Kittle, Richard Sherman, just go around the league of these later round picks that hit the studs. Like football is a major priority in their life. And I, I love it during this time of year, whenever the media makes a big deal, it's like, why does everybody want have a balanced life? But the NFL is not a balanced life. For six months of the year, all your chips are in the middle of the table as a coach, as a player. It doesn't mean you don't get to see your son or your wife or go to dinner with them sometimes during the year, but you spend a large amount of time, a large percentage of the pie chart doing football stuff. And anytime, whether you make $10 or whether you make $10 million, if you're going to spend and allocate a lot of your time and energy towards something, that's why most successful people tell you if you can do anything, try to find something you enjoy doing it. It sounds cheesy, but it's so fucking true. Because if you enjoy doing something, you are less likely to not do it. Because most times, I don't care if you're a football player, a podcaster, a car salesman, you name it. You're going to have to work sometimes when it's like, you know, I'd rather be at the beach. I'd rather be at dinner with my wife. I'd rather just be at home doing nothing. And sometimes you got to work. Sometimes you got to do stuff. And when you like doing it, it makes it much more possible. And I think we're going to see so many guys drafted that are going to be not good football players and so many guys drafted later who are better than them at football. I think a lot of it comes down to the person. And that's my favorite part about the draft is the value aspect. Where do the player I want, what round do I have to take them to get them on my team? Regardless of do I think the guy's going to be a Hall of Famer, Pro Bowl, or whatever, I like this guy a lot and I want to draft him. But I don't need to take them in the second round because I can get them in the fourth. And the good GMs know exactly how to maneuver that. Second favorite part is like the wiring of the individuals that you draft. Because most guys are talented, right? Drafting guys from Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, USC, Texas, all over the... Not Texas, they haven't had many draft picks lately, but they will this year. But you know what I mean. What separates them is the stuff that you just... It ain't the jumping... It ain't the arm length. That stuff does, but that's why they're good or not at their you know position, right? But what's going to sustain and what's going to have them pass guys and what's going to have the guys not make it is all the intangible stuff. And uh, you can do all the research you want. You can talk to everyone in the program. But man, like it's a lot of you guys listening right now, like, you know, there weren't many people that believed in me, right? You think that you like you're a successful human being. You you can people can tell you good, bad, or indifferent, but like what separates people is once they get there, the player, what's inside deep down. Sounds cliche or stupid, but it's just a fact. Uh let's fire through a couple things. Rand Carthen, the new general manager for the Tennessee Titans. So they have not received any calls. <laughs> my my, uh, my Uber driver the other day that said Derrick Henry was going to the Eagles. I think he read a poor article. I read it too. It was it was surfacing there on the interweb. Uh, Rand Carthen, I don't know why he would lie. He just said, we haven't received any calls. And I talked to a buddy that was like, why would the Eagles trade? Do you know how much money Derrick Henry makes? Like no one's trading for a guy that makes that much money. Especially, you know, he's getting a little up there in age. Why is DeAndre Hopkins not traded? Not because he can't play, because he makes 19 plus million dollars a year. If DeAndre Hopkins made seven, 10 teams would have tried to trade for him. You make 19 million dollars, it's a little hard to trade for you. Uh, the betting markets have Will Levis going number two overall. Uh, Vegas, you know, usually makes more money than they lose. But I know this. And I'm, I'm, I guess I'm probably closer to a Will Levis fan than someone I know Coward, you know, I, and I understand the jacked aspect. It's more about pliability than it is muscles at quarterback. 100% agree. Like that's, that's a fact. Pliability. Look at, look at some of the best quarterbacks. I mean, Peyton and look at Peyton and Tom Brady with their shirt off, right? Drew Brees. I mean, these guys are not, they don't look like linebackers, right? Aaron Rodgers. They, these guys, you, you do not need to be super jacked. And some of the super jacked quarterbacks, that come to mind, especially for older people, is like Kyle Bowler, 
Brady Quinn. It's harder to play football when you're tight and you're not fluid, right? Golf's the same thing. Pitching's the same thing. Not about big muscles, about fluidity, throwing the ball, touch. Now, I watched Will Levis a couple years ago. I liked him. Good buddy in the NFL swears that if Liam Cohen, who is now the OC again, had never left Kentucky, this guy would be competing to go number one overall. That Rich Scangarello, who everyone in the NFL kind of makes fun of, stinks and kind of ruined this guy. Now, you could also just say he doesn't see pressure. He gets sacked too often. He doesn't take, you know, he throws the ball too hard, no touch. I personally, if I was going to take Levis, who is also kind of a swing for the fences, or Anthony Richardson, I think I would swing on Anthony Richardson. Because everything I've heard about the character, Will Levis, really good character. Anthony Richardson, same thing. So the character, the work ethic, all that stuff is similar. I'm swinging for the fences either way, right? (laughs) I'm trying to hit a home run here. Neither of these guys are viewed as doubles. Or it's like, you know what? Worst case scenario, you just get a single, you get to round a second, you just kind of roll back, and you just get a quarterback who can function. That's... That's not the case with these guys. So I would personally take a swing for the fence. I I would take a swing for the fence, right? Like Bryce Young, even CJ, it's like those guys, ton of tape. They've been really good. These two guys, most people think Will Levis this year was terrible. And Anthony Richardson beside the Utah game, some people think he's like undraftable. But the other betting market has him as a lock to go in the top five. Like if one of the guys go in the top five, I would swing with Anthony Richardson. I did a little informal poll texting around most people that reacted to me now a lot of them are teams that do not need quarterbacks agreed Uh, agreed and i'm not some will levis stinks guy but if i was going to lean one of the two of them because both of them feel like a big stretch right in the history of the draft i remember i think i mentioned this on the podcast one day i was listening to dj's pod move the sticks and i text him right he came into the league in the early 2000s and i said what would those type players what round would they have gone in in 2001? He's like, the fourth or fifth. Like, so it, quarterback inflation's real, but so is inflation everywhere. Like, right? Things cost more money. You want a pair of shoes? You want to buy a bicycle? You fucking see how much gas in Arizona is like 520. Things are expensive. Right or wrong, just the way it is. So you want Will Levis, you want Anthony Richardson, you got to take a high pick. I, I would lean Anthony Richardson. So on the internet streets, people giving the Cardinals, Kyler Murray, Oklahoma's spring game was this weekend, and they gave him a statue. So a lot of people making fun that the statue was way too big. Obviously, Kyler's small. But a bunch of, you know, the new coach, the new GM, the contingent of just new Arizona people went to go see it. And I guess I just heard people say this. They're like, oh, everyone was giving them a hard time. And I always have a hard time with that one. Like, who's everyone? Seven people on Twitter? Some booger eaters? People with a combined 600 followers? You know, does that count? Who cares? <laughs> I, I just think that's so stupid whenever we do that. It's one of my least favorite things when I see someone in the media go, everyone was giving them, who's everyone? Find me everyone. Three guys with numbers on their Twitter avatar said this is stupid. They should be watching tape. That does not count. No one actually cares. If anything, like, yeah, good supportive move. Do they ideally want Kyler Murray? You know, probably not, but they're stuck with him. Because the last GM, last coach, and the owner gave him just a contract that is probably going to be one of the great disasters in the history of the league. One thing that I'll end on this. I I wonder if Lamar could get traded on draft night. Just seems like, I don't know. You just, I wouldn't discount it. I'm not expecting it, but crazier things have happened. I never expected A.J. Brown to get traded. I know it's, it's different with a quarterback, but... Are we sure that in the middle of the draft or early in the draft, Lamar Jackson has been traded? They just re-signed Tyler Huntley, who is one of the great I did not see coming I've ever seen. (laughs) I watch a lot of Pac-12 football. did not think Tyler Huntley was an NFL quarterback, let alone a guy that you could win NFL games with. Ravens have pulled that off. And I wonder maybe they make a trade. They draft a quarterback kind of reset their salary cap. I'm not expecting it. Got my spidey senses up, though. Got got my spidey senses up. Is, Is it just on the table? Let's keep an eye for that.